thank you for um, for coming and thank you for inviting me. I'm very uh, happy to be here. Um, very happy that um, Tommaso uh, invited me to to uh, join this session. Um, and I'm I'm sort of thrilled to hear what you have to say later about what we are trying to do in this space. So I call the presentation Breaching Place, um, and I hope that will be uh, somewhat clear later, a little later in the presentation why I called it that. And um, I should also say before I really get started that this is, my presentation is based on the, oh sorry, um, it's, it's based on um, a paper that I published with two of my um, students, um, Frederick Mosko, Lesse Hulgo, uh, and it's a paper called Incidental Encounters with Robots that we presented at uh, Roman, um, the Roman conference this year. I should also say that it's a little bit unusual for me to uh, be in such a highly sort of... Um, technical field as this, so I come from the information systems, um, uh, the information systems department at the business school, um, and my own background has some elements of human-computer interaction and design research in it, but uh, I'm really thrilled to be um, coming into this field a little bit and, and sort of understanding what is going on. Um, yeah. So, um, so I'll have to, I'll have to just look a little bit because it's apparently not uh, entirely on the screen. So I have to just look at uh, a little bit on the um, on the screens here. So we had three concern, three major concerns uh, as we were writing um, up this paper. We didn't actually initially expect it to become a paper. We just wanted to to try out a few things. Um, we wanted to use uh, in the wild methods. So really not sort of. Uh, uh, controlled lab studies or anything like that. Um, we wanted to use uh, ethnography-inspired methods uh, and approaches uh, because none of us, me nor my students, were trained in doing sort of proper lab studies. So we thought we could do something interesting with robots. Uh, nevertheless, so as I suggest, we're, we're a business school, so we don't really have a lab. Um, so um, we had to go outside a bit and do some things. We were also interested in the role or the um, the sense of public uh, places, the sort of emergent uh, digitalization in public place, um, uh, and you know the way in which robots are suggested to be. Um, let loose on uh, you know urban and public spaces, and what might some of those desirable futures of uh, robots be when they enter public spaces? So I think one of the things that we use this phrase "desirable futures" is to suggest that we find that designers are often very responsive in relation to uh, user needs. Um, and we thought that maybe designers can also be more uh, generative of scenarios and ideas that uh, are indeed desirable and not just responsive to kind of, um, kind of needs. Um, we borrowed a, a small a remote controlled robot from a small Danish company called Capra Robotics. It's a small driving robot and we were just discussing what to do with it so we tried to figure out how we could could do something interesting. Also, we were not interested in operators uh, or people who interacted directly with the robot. Actually, we couldn't really sort of imagine who would interact directly with the robot. Um, so we thought this would be sort of an autonomous uh, device. Um, but we also had this understanding that the robot would be out and about in the city. So one of the scenarios for the particular robot that we looked at was to be sort of a trash collecting robot in a pedestrian area. <clears throat> so the aim of the study was to try to understand what we, uh, we borrowed this term um, called incidentally co-present persons in public place. 
and trying to explore reactions and classifications of this strange machine driving among us um, uh, by the non-interactants in a specific context. This could be termed maybe social acceptability, but it also talks into kind of ideas about the public or the sort of the quality of urban spaces, the idea of, of trust, comfort, safety, and all these things that we wanted to, to uh, engage with. So we kind of turned towards what one might call a place-centric perspective. So we're not interested in, not particularly interested in individual psychology, but we're interested in the quality of place. And then thirdly, Another aim of the study was to showcase and sort of further develop the idea of the breaching experiment as a lightweight approach for human-robot interaction. <clears throat> so we were definitely in the lower uh, and maybe less developed uh, quadrant of this uh, figure. So doing an in-the-wild study with people who were just incidentally present while a robot was driving through a public space. So let me talk a little bit about the uh, idea of the breaching experiment and why I think, why we think it's useful and has some potential. The idea of the breaching experiment is to, um, in a sense, elicit social order through the disruption of the taken for grantedness of everyday life. So we go about life with a very sort of keen you could say, instinctive uh, sense of what is right and what is wrong and what is proper and what is un, uh, improper in space. And Harold, Harold Garfinkel, a sociologist working mainly in the, the late 60s, um, suggested this idea of ethnomethodology and the breaching experiment was one of the sort of more well-known concepts that emerged from ethnomethodology. So it focuses on people's desire and ability to maintain moral and social order in the face of unusual situations uh, in everyday life. And he suggested that in order to do what he called a breaching experiment, you should start with a familiar scene and ask what can be done to make trouble. So in other words, to kind of expose what, fam what the fam familiar rules and, and sort of uh, understandings of the places, we need to kind of break those things a little bit in order to see what they're made of and how people react. So there are some well-known um, experiments or uh, uh, breaching experiments. You know, Garfinkel was, was uh, asking his students to, one of the more well-known, to go back to their parents and act as if they were a lodger and, and ask, you know, uh, ask permission to use the bathroom and, you know, these kinds of things. And the parents, of course, would be highly confused about this. So it indicates, the breaching experiment indicates some violation of the local norm. Uh, there are some um, student experiments, uh, such as just standing still in, in a public space. What happens? Yeah. And you probably know the feeling of also the co uh, uncomfortable feeling of, of loitering in a public space and people look at you strangely and they think, what are you doing? Um, could be eating something unusual or another Garfinkel classic shop shopping from other people's basket in the supermarket. That definitely sort of prompts a little bit of reactions. Um, but I don't think we don't necessarily have to do very sort of strange things in order to uh, make trouble in, in, in the sense that Garfinkel uh, talks about. Uh, there are a few papers that have employed uh, these ideas from the breaching experiment, some of these um, uh, papers, and, and we, th we thought we might sort of continue down that, that line. So, for instance, uh, Andy Crabtree uh, talks about designing in the absence of practice. So what do we do if there's no sort of practice available for us to observe? Well, we start sort of we start provoking uh, some kind of reaction by um, having technologies and, and observing how technologies break down uh, the sense of norm normality in a place, for instance. 
So um, uh, Garfinkel writes something like, breaching experiments are demonstrations designed in Herbert Spiegelberg's phrase as aids to a sluggish imagination. We can't really imagine what technology will do to places, for instance. It's very difficult for us to do that. So these experiments that are not so sort of proper psychological experiments, of course, um, they aid us to you know, help us think about what might happen. And I found they produce reflections through which the strangeness of an obstinately familiar world can be detected. So they are a way to sort of breach the normal scene. Breaching experiments aim to call forth or invoke some kind of observable social action and maybe enable some reasoning by designers. I'm also um, looking back to one of my uh, an, 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 an old, um, older paper by a, a, a Danish colleague who talks about provotypes. So the idea of using prototypes as sort of provocational uh, tools to call forth uh, reactions. Right. So, um, basically, it's an interruption of the local production or of accomplishment of business as usual. We discussed a little bit, so I'm, I'm sort of keen to discuss some of these theoretical foundations of human-computer interaction with my students, and we thought about the relation to another philosopher, you know, Martin Heidegger's notion of of um, uh, ready at hand and present at hand, this thing that, you know, we're only able to reason about a thing once it sort of breaks down. Uh, the breakdown is a very sort of good opportunity for us to reflect on practice. So, yeah, finally, the robot. Um, it's a bit of an, uh, I think that was a, some kind of IKEA <laughs> box we put on top of it just to make it look a little bit like one of those commercial robots. Uh, this was very much a, a, um, a very simple uh, initial uh, prototype from Capro Robotics, um, and this was the um, this was the space that we employed it in. This is from the Copenhagen Business School campus. So there's a campus up here, and then there's this walkway, which is a sort of a shared modality. Uh, space, uh, it's got lights, and it's got lots of obstacles and uh, other things. People use their bicycles, they walk the dogs, they, they're not actually supposed to be biking there, but you know, it's Copenhagen, so it's like bicycles are like water, they just seep in everywhere. Um, there's some loitering, there's some people hanging around, students and so on. So you see sort of a bird's eye view here of the area, and um, this is Lesser, who acted as uh, the wizard in this sort of Wizard of Oz experiment that we, that we did. And he was uh, covertly controlling the robot under his jacket very neatly. And we did ask permission from the, from the school, of course, to, to run this experiment, so it's the, um, we, uh, we suggested that it was not uh, potentially sort of harmful uh, in, 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 uh, in any way. <clears throat> the data collection that we did was really to do um, uh, some quick debrief, some quick impressions interviews. So my two students, one was doing the operation of the robot and the other one was running around and sort of like catching people after the interaction or after the encounter, let's say, with the uh, robot. And, and ask them a few questions. Uh, we had 338 registered encounters, children, adults, senior citizens, caregivers, cyclists, and a few dogs um, who were very interested, obviously. Um, it also included some observation of body language and behaviors, people shying away, stopping to explore the robot, disregarding, you know, these students who are sort of too cool for school, basically sort of like not pretending not to, um, not to see the robot. And one of the observations that we did sort of fairly systematically was to see that or to understand from both 
this observation and as well as sort of this quick debrief that we had, had that people are very good at ordering uh, unexpected uh, situations or this unusual actor through classification, using what we might call the local knowledge and the working knowledge, you know, what is this place about? They knew that this was a university campus, many of them knew that, um, so they had some local knowledge that enabled them to make sense of the robot in place. And they used that in a very sort of ad hoc manner, putting all kinds of labels on them that we registered, like it's an, it's an electronic pet of some kind, or other people suggested that it might be some sort of entertainment. Some people are just very, very unsure about it, so they didn't had any, have any idea about what, it, what was going on. Others suggested that it may be a working robot, and yet others saw the robot as a threat, something slightly um, uh, dangerous driving around, and so on. <clears throat> yep. um, some of the research trajectories that we find um, after this and some of the stuff that we would like to carry on doing and, and maybe sort of expand a little is also the opportunity to try to formalize or try to sort of work a little bit with the, uh, the variables in our study. Um, for instance, we tried a few scenarios where we had sort of a very, or something that to us seemed to indicate a very clear purpose of the robot. In this case, driving around with a defibrillator, you know, heart thing, machine, you know, for emergencies and so on. And it clearly sort of indicated with a sort of official looking uh, flag. So it seemed to have a clear purpose. Um, and another, another uh, variable was this idea of driving the robot into one of the ditches and sort of like uh, making it look like it had some difficulty getting out of the ditch. And we even had a number of cyclists, you know, stopping to, to help the uh, little robot out of its misery and, uh, and carry on. Um, or obstacles that seemed to be uh, difficult to... Do we have these scooters lying around everywhere? Uh, so we do that in Copenhagen, at least, for some reason. Um, I'm always kind of like trying to put them somewhere else than maybe on the sidewalk. I wonder why people sort of keep leaving them sort of in these very, um, very strange places. Um, so all of these things are things that we intend to carry on working with and trying to look at some of the reactions that emerge from these kinds of interactions. And obviously also some changes in the local uh, variables. Driving the robot at night would seem to have potentially other implications uh, since visibility is poor and so on. Um, rather than daylight, here's a nice promotional shot of Copenhagen, so if you should come, of course. Um, the other uh, image is also from Copenhagen, looks a bit more like Blade Runner. Um, but it's just normal day in Copenhagen. Um, yeah, so one, some of the reflections that, that came out of this study and why we thought, um, uh, you know, why, why it helped us sort of think about uh, a number of new things that we hadn't really thought about and that we feel is maybe a little bit um, underrepresented in the, in the literature. Uh, first of all, it, our study had relatively low barriers, um, uh, practical barriers in, in terms of application. It was very easy to set up. Uh, so we thought that, or we think that it's a sort of promising lightweight method that can be applied in a relatively uh, easy manner. Then we also found some need to exaggerate robot behaviors to elicit uh, elicit rich responses from our our stakeholders or from our interactants, these incidentally co-present persons that we were looking at. Um, I don't think we necessarily have to think about the really sort of strange uh, or outrageous behavior by the robot to elicit um, to, to elicit uh, rich 
um, information, but kind of think about the robot itself as a very sort of strange intrusion into public space that nevertheless might need, because you know many of our uh, the stakeholders, though the the, the co-present persons there, they had some idea of robots, you know, delivery robots, these kinds of things. We've seen it in little promotional videos. We haven't seen one in real life, but there was a sort of a clear, relatively clear understanding of this being a plausible, plausible explanation for why the robot was roaming around. <clears throat> of course, our approach is highly contextual low generalizability, I suppose. But we also found that it was potentially, and we found some ideas for how to make it potentially transferable to settings of, of somewhat dim similar kinds. For instance, um, finding insights that can be transferred across, across functional typologies of urban uh, spaces, like thinking about the space as an actor in uh, the interaction you know, space as the context, but also as something that provides the background for the interaction. Uh, we could think about maybe a pedestrian walkway at a campus, which was where we made our study, but also think about more sort of, or think about different kinds of uh, areas like a pedestrian areas for shopping, a leisure and socialization area, waiting zones, and so on. So all of these things can be, you know, tried with this uh, breaching experiment method. And um, I, we're fairly sure that different results will emerge and some insight will come into, um, also we will get the, some insights into how public spaces sort of shape uh, different kinds of human-robot interaction. So we thought about thinking about, or we thought about, we think about um, the norms and performances of place as a co-actor in the relationship between humans and robots in this study. You know, how places are, are done, you could say, and what people know and what people need to know about places in order to uh, interact with it. So in that sense, it's perhaps not a user-centric study, but a study that is more place-centric in its nature, um, trying to understand something about places. And this actually concludes my presentation. Thank you very much.